Hello, welcome to The Farmhouse. I'm Candice Wierzbowski. And I'm Stephanie Spiker. And today we're going to be talking to Lisa Boltz. Lisa is an ag teacher at Shippensburg Area Senior High School, and she recently won the 2023 National Association of Agricultural Educators Ideas Unlimited Award. Steph, did you ever take any ag courses in high school or were you a part of FFA? My school had a really good ag program and FFA program, but I was so busy with band and choir and doing that kind of stuff that that took up my like elective courses so I didn't have room in my schedule for ag my sister did though but what about you were you in any ag classes no I don't think my school offered any and we didn't have an FFA which looking back is kind of strange given that we were a small school in a very rural area I mean our school abutted to a farm but yeah that that wasn't offered I think if you were interested in ag you had to go to a Votech school Hmm, interesting Um, But hopefully Lisa can give us some insight into what it's like to be in those courses and and what it's like to be in the FFA. Um, So I'm looking forward to getting to know her a little better. So I actually, I already know Lisa a little bit. We went to the same high school. We both went to Northern Lebanon High School in Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. And then um, we actually also both went to Penn State as well, even though we were never in the same classes up there. But yeah, so um, I've known her for, well, I've been graduated over 10 years, so over 10 years now, but I haven't seen her for a long time, so it'll be nice to catch up. Great. Well, let's hear what she has to say. Lisa, hello. Welcome to the Farmhouse Podcast. Thank you. I am so glad to be on the air with you guys. Great. Well, we always start off our podcast with the same question for everyone, and that is, did you always want to work in agriculture? Funny enough, um, I did not. So when I was growing up, my family owned a campground at the time. It was called Lickdale Campground, and then we changed it to Jonestown KOA. Um, so I didn't grow up in an agricultural family. Of course, we had agricultural ties, as in um, my grandparents had their own animals that they raised to butcher. Um, we sig- had significantly large gardens, things like that. Um, but otherwise, like I was not connected to commercial agriculture in any way. And then when I was in eighth grade, the eighth graders at Northern Lebanon take tours of the electives to determine what they would be interested in when they moved to high school. And my tour was with Gretchen Oberst at Northern Lebanon. And she mentioned that every ninth grader has to take elements of agriculture and they had to complete a rabbit breeding project for meat rabbits at the school. And then if you were enterprise was profitable, this was an intro SAE, Um, if your enterprise was profitable, you got a free bunny. And of course, me being me, I'm like, oh, yes, the free bunny. (laughs) Um, So that's what hooked me into agriculture. And then throughout my four years of agriculture education in high school, it was just like instantaneous. I absolutely loved agriculture from then on. That's so impressive. I had to breed um, fruit flies at one point in high school, Ah. and it didn't (laughs) It didn't go over so well for me, but it sounds a little less fun than a bunny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I don't know if you've ever deal- dealt with uh, New Zealand meat rabbits, but they can be vicious. So I learned oh. quite quickly. <laughs> I learned quite quickly <laughs> um, that it's not all that is productive to be all the time. But did you get your uh, your pet rabbit then out of it? I did. I did. I named it Charlie. Charlie. I love Aww. that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so sounds like you knew you know, at least going into college that you wanted to work in ag. What inspired you to become a teacher? Uh, Believe it or not, Miss Oberst. Um, So I had um, some fantastic agriculture teachers at Northern Lebanon, and um, I wanted to connect back to that. So I wanted to work. I knew I wanted to work with people first and foremost, and I knew I wanted to um, work in agriculture in some way. So that limited the amount of options I had. Um, for a long time, I actually uh, entertained the thought of going into some type of ag lobbying type. Um, I interned with Pennsylvania Farm Bureau and their government and communications division and absolutely loved it. Um, so when it gets down to it, um, I chose education, which does have a lot of uh, political play into it. Um, but uh, I always was interested in working with people throughout that. Um, and it does connect back to some of my government and communications background a little bit. So you are teaching currently um, with Shippensburg High School. Yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about their ag and FFA programs and like what all kinds of different classes do you get to teach? 
Yeah. So our agriculture program is an expanding program. So prior to me um, getting on board at Shippensburg, Kelly Beer was a one teacher program for 17 years um, with her there. We have been a long existing program in Pennsylvania. I believe our charter is from 1929 or 1930. I can't remember right off the top of my head. But um, we've been a very historic chapter in the area. And um, we teach a total of 13 different ag courses. And we share that between Kelly and myself now. We have 270 students at Shippensburg that are enrolled in agriculture education. And then if you know anything about ag education in Pennsylvania, if you are a member of an ag course, you are automatically a member of FFA through affiliation. So all of our students are have the opportunity to be involved in the FFA and we are very active. So um, for example, we have 18 students getting their first year jacket at Farm Show and three students getting their Keystone at Farm Show at that midwinter convention. And we are consistently seeing our numbers growing um, with the addition of my position, the second ag teacher position. We just have more opportunities to get the students in the classroom to be able to do the things that they want to do. That's cool. I didn't realize SHIP had such a big program. Yeah. um, So it's very comparable to Northern Lebanon. Steph, I can't remember. Did you were you in any of the ag classes at Northern Lebanon? I was not just because I never had room in my schedule. But my sister was because we also had rabbits from Northern yes. London FFA. <laughs> yes. Yes. There you go. They're historic rabbits. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so it's very comparable to Northern Lebanon's numbers when um, we were in high school. Um, I would say there's more involvement um, in the FFA chapter at Northern Lebanon than there is at Shippensburg, but we see a, a bit more students in our classes at Shippensburg, partially because um, I teach on a block schedule half credit. So what that means is I have four classes a day for 82 minutes a block. And then rather than having them for the full semester at a full credit, I have them for half of a semester, which is a marking period. So it's a high turnaround on my kids. Um, I only have them for that one 45 minute or 45 day block of time, which is a marking period. Um, So we see a lot more kids. um, And in that time, it's a little bit harder to grab them and pull them into FFA. But some kids, like with the addition of our middle school club that we have right now, Mr. and Mrs. Stoner at the middle school have been doing a phenomenal job. Like we can see it in our ninth graders that they're just like ready to jump right in off the deep end to get to the FFA. And it's been awesome. That's cool. That must be like very energizing as a teacher to see students that are you know, so into it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right, right off the bat. And the kids feed off of your energy. So if you're excited about them being excited, it's just, Mm -hmm. it builds momentum. Nice. Like an awesome feedback loop. (laughs) What do you want your students to take away from your courses? Largely, I want them to be an informed consumer. So I acknowledge not all of my kids are going to be in agriculture. I know that some of them will be inspired to go into agricultural careers following my classes. And that's fantastic. But I know every single one of them will be influenced by agriculture in some way, shape, or form, whether it's the food that they eat, obviously, on a daily basis, or it's um, land that they're managing, whether it be natural resources or for agricultural use. And I want them to understand how to critically think about the skills that I teach them in my class and the basic information I give them, and know that as an informed consumer, you are making educated decisions based on what you know and what you are able to gain from the resources out there so that way they can make good choices and know agricultural side of the story that actually also answers another question that we were going to ask you kind of but um do you want to uh yeah i mean i can put it out there we'll keep going with Uh, that with that thought yeah i was just wondering you know if we could talk about the students who might not see a future for themselves in ag and therefore may not be drawn um to take an animal science class or any kind of ag related class um like how do you think a student like that might benefit from, you know, taking an ag-related class. Um, I mean, it kind of sounds like the informed consumer is a big part of that. But, you know, if if you were trying to, I guess, sell one of these students who's thinking, well, you know, I... I, I want to go into the trades or uh, I want to go to college for, for business. Um, why should they consider maybe taking one of these courses? 
The fact that agriculture is so vast, it, there is truly a place for everyone in it. So you mentioned somebody who wants to go into business. Well, if they understand the agribusiness side, they have a leg up on an area of business that not many people do. Agribusiness is its whole other animal compared to other business um, strategies and principles. And that is actually one of our courses that we teach and the differences of our business department and our agriculture Class, agri agribusiness class that we have is something that we teach. So essentially, I, I try to do multiple things when they're in the class, obviously, as a teacher, one being an informed, uh, an informed consumer Two, um, knowing that there is a place for everyone in agriculture, and some way, shape or form, they're going to be influenced by it, whether it be directly in their career, or elsewise. And then three, agriculture at its core is an applied science. So if we have our kids who are trying to pass the biology keystone, um, I have noticed a lot of my kids um, are, they sometimes struggle to apply what they learn in biology class to agriculture and they need a little bit more guidance doing that. Um, for instance, in my companion animal care class, I teach genetics with cat hair lengths um, and we practice with the Punnett squares and then in my companion animal care two class, when we cover guinea pigs um, and then other small mammals, we're going to do a dye hybrid cross of genetics with um, both the hair length and the hair texture and applying those genetics principles that we see in biology to an agriculture course gives it something a little bit more real for the kids to make it a tangible concept. And then um, my hopes is that when it's a tangible concept, approaching something like their keystone testing is a little bit more attainable for them. Um, and at Shippensburg, because our school board acknowledges how applied of a science agriculture is, they actually give an elective science credit for it, which is a graduation requir for requirement for our seniors. They can take either agriculture or a whole bunch of other science electives, but agriculture um, satisfies that need as a graduation requirement. It sounds like there's plenty of reasons. I mean, oh right. yeah, for sure. Like, <laughs> I'm sold. Yeah, anyone can take an ag <laughs> class and get something out of it. So that's exciting. Of course. Yeah. So I definitely want to ask you about um, your recent Ideas Unlimited Award, which congratulations, Congrats, by the yeah. way, like a Thank national you. award. That's impressive. Um, Thank you. So I know you did a project or you're still like you do currently yeah. in school with with wool. And I would just love to hear a little more about how that came about and how, you know, your students seem to kind of react to it and, and learn from it. Yes. So um, it originated from the fact that I, uh, I taught at Chambersburg when I first came up with the idea. And then I had moved to Shippensburg in the process of that. So both schools, um, the first school, Chambersburg, was a very, very city school, very city-like. And there was no possible way to get livestock into the classroom. And um, being that, I wanted something tangible for the kids to interact with, and wool is a great example of how we do that. Um, I had done this with other things like cheeses, meat, that sort of thing, um, and wool happened to be a way to do that. And um, then at Shippensburg, I um, am not currently able to bring livestock into the classroom just because of liability concerns with our insurance. Um, so we are working towards being able to um, possibly bring livestock in in the future or other animals in in the future. But at this point, um, both of those districts, I didn't have the opportunity to bring in animals. So I started working with the products rather than the animals. And when I do that, um, I landed with the idea of working with wool. And the tricky part is finding a wool product that they can actually make within the confines of a classroom. We don't have a lot of um, extra funding for miscellaneous equipment um and we don't have a lot of um access to to equipment that is potentially breakable like for instance an antique spinning wheel i would mm -hmm. never bring into a classroom with 24 kids um so the idea of trying to find a product that the kids would buy into was a little bit harder and i was talking with a fantastic agriculture teacher mrs fleener and she raises sheep and i um I reached out to her and she said, do, dry, do dryer balls. I make dryer balls. And I'm like, I never even thought of that. So um, we started with raw wool. I got it actually from one of my students' grandparents that craft wool. 
and they we take it from raw wool fresh off the sheep we watch some shearing videos we talk about how sheep are raised and shorn and then i'm like okay here's your wool and we start by grading the wool and then we skirt the wool which is the process of removing large debris and um get it ready to be scoured which is the process of removing lanolin and once it's scoured we let it out to dry and it's carded. Carding gets the fibers all in the same direction and also removes the smaller debris that we weren't able to get with tweezers. So like little small microscopic bits of straw and other things, dust fall out in that say, stage. And then once they have it carded, they form these roll ags off of their um, slicker brushes. And we actually use dog slicker brushes from the Dollar Tree because <laughs> cards, um, cards are very expensive to get a good set of cards. And in my class, because we're doing the dryer balls, it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be fancy. We're not doing large quantities. So the dog slicker brushes just work. Um, and then after they form their roll legs, they hand spin the wool into a ball form. And then I take it home and I felt it in my washing machine in a pair of nylons. And they get it back and we do a nice long talk about doing our own laundry and how it's an important skill. <laughs> that is by far a huge skill that too many kids go to college without knowing. So yes. yeah, <laughs> too many adults too, that yeah. I feel like yeah. barely know how to do their own laundry. Yes. Yes. Um, I, it would shock you. Most kids don't know what a dryer ball is when we start talking about it, or they'll be like, yeah, my mom uses them, but I'm not sure why. And then that gives us an open door to talk about, well, wool actually has amazing capabilities of holding its weight in water um, and that the ball bouncing around in there helps loosen up the clothing as it's going through the dryer, along with other things. But um, it helps open the door to talk about wool characteristics. Such a like practical yeah. thing, too, because it's, it's something that they're creating and they're understanding how it's made, yeah. where it came from, what its uses are, and then they actually get like a physical thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yep. It's very cool. Have you, have you heard from any parents whether or not these kids are now going home and doing their laundry? <laughs> I want to say not. I'm not going to lie to you. So I, I work in a high school and I 100% think as soon as those dryer balls leave my room, they are now balls as in like projectiles. <laughs> right. We're throwing yeah. them at They're each flying other. across the hallway maybe. It's fine. So, and I tell them not to, but sometimes they don't listen to their teacher. Shocking. Shocking. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, so I have not heard back. Um, I have had students contact me, like, for instance, my Chambersburg kids. This was three years ago at this point. Some of them have contacted me and said that they use them. So that is great. Um, but I have not heard from parents. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very cool. I mean, and, and it's exciting to hear from students that, you know, they they are still remembering what they learned and using that product. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to pivot just a little bit in talking about um, FFA, because I know you obviously had some experiences in FFA, and now you're seeing it from a teacher's standpoint. Yeah. And, you know, working here over the past, like, six years, we've got to meet a lot of FFA kids and the state yeah. officers and just, you know, local FFA kids. And I've noticed that you really do see a lot of girls in leadership positions in FFA, especially yeah. at the state level, it seems like. You know, yeah. there's always guys who are state officers, but you see a lot of girls. And yeah, I think currently on the Pennsylvania State there's Officer a, Board, there's only, only one guy. The lone yeah. man holding yeah. the team. Yeah. But, <laughs> so, you know, what is it about FFA as an organization that you think, like, helps to encourage girls and women to get involved in ag, which is still, in a lot of ways, pretty male-dominated? Yes. So it's actually been a trend um, for quite some time that we were seeing um, increases in females in leadership positions. So our chapter officers and, our, of course, you noticed our state officers are increasingly becoming more uh, female oriented. And there's um, current research out there as to why that's happening and why we're seeing that trend shift. Um, and we actually at Shippensburg are having a tough time recruiting the men. Um, we are two female agricultures in an, a program. And um, we have on our officer team right now, we have two gentlemen and we actively tell them frequently, like, please, please, please make sure we're reaching out to the men in our chapter and recruiting them. So that way they're not getting left behind um, because women um, that I have noticed with uh, my girls on my officer team, they do a fantastic job at networking themselves. And the FFA at its essence 
does a fantastic job of letting this be student led. And if the kids want to do something, they have to be the ones to go and do it. Um, Mrs. Beer and I do a great job at being there and guiding voices and helping organize things. But there is sincerely way too much for us to do just as ourselves. Um, and so when it gets down to it, if the kid is willing to organize and plan and um, make all of the arrangements necessary to do things and to be successful in the FFA, um, we support them fully through that process. And I think the girls um, see that um, specifically in education, like the girls are seeing that and running with it. They are very, very motivated. And not that the guys aren't, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it's, it, they see opportunities in the FFA and they see very few barriers for those opportunities because um, we are setting them up for success and they can see that we're helping them through those challenges. Um, so I feel like even though agriculture as an industry is very male dominated, the girls are getting that leadership side and running with it. Um, and maybe it's not necessarily that they don't have agriculture experience coming in, um, but it's that they're finding those opportunities post high school. Um, if that makes any sense. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to word it. So like the girls that I've noticed, the girls that are super involved in agriculture in our chapter don't necessarily have agriculture experience outside of the chapter and education. Is that making sense? Yeah. So <laughs> it's like the FFA, especially your chapter specifically, is kind of opening a door to women and, and the guys who don't have any ag experience to come in and then leave equipped and ready to be in the ag industry. Correct. Correct. So yes, you thank God you picked up exactly what I was trying <laughs> I'm, to put I'm down with there. you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, our, and that's uh, one of like, if you think back to what I said about, um, having the kids be informed consumers, Kelly and I's goal, um, is to make, our students informed consumers. So that includes teaching to kids who aren't from agriculture backgrounds. We are a very approachable chapter. We are a chapter that, and an ag program that we want our kids to have those new experiences and to learn from those new experiences. And um, the kids also that come from agriculture backgrounds, they oftentimes are investigating areas of agriculture that they're not familiar with. Like right now our chapter president um, grew up raising market livestock and um, she explores a lot with plants. Does she have a lot of plant experience already? Yes, but she helps us a lot um, most recently with our house plant sale and um, our greenhouse sales that we do. She has been working with quite frequently um, and she doesn't have that um, super production experience to my knowledge. Um, so it's an area for her to elaborate on. Um, and that's the case with almost all of our members. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, we're gonna pivot back a little towards uh, <laughs> towards teaching in general. Um, there's just been a lot of challenges, it seems, lately um, facing educators today. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. it seems like we're seeing a lot of burnout in that profession. And I just wondered, is that something that, that you've ever struggled with? Um, and if so, how do you push through when you're having that kind of rough moment? Of course. So. Um, something that I was very apprehensive about in coming to Shippensburg was this is my third district. So I taught for two years down in Georgia, one year at Chambersburg, and then now I'm in my second year at Shippensburg. And when I look at that from an educator's standpoint, I'm like, man, sometimes teachers are probably going to look at me and say, there's got to be something wrong with that teacher. And then I look at it um, and I had a lot of advice from some fantastic teachers throughout the state and said, no, 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 no. you've got to find a school that fits you and you've got to find a school that um, will support you in the ways that you need to be supported. And Shippensburg does that for me. So I'm at a point now where I'm comfortable and I'm not feeling the burnout that I was. Do I have days where I get exhausted? Of course, but you have to get to a district um, that has the administration support, that has your colleagues support most importantly, and that you can connect with the students. Um, I can honestly say at both Camden um, in Georgia and Chambersburg, my students were phenomenal. Um, and I, I think most teachers can agree. It's, it's never necessarily the kids as to why you're moving. Um, and it's not necessarily one specific thing. It's just, I was feeling burnt out at those two places. And 
finding a fit that is correct for you is essential, especially when you're doing agriculture education. Um, when I was in Georgia, I had a 30 day extension on my contract plus 30 hours a month. So what that meant was I was getting essentially a version of overtime is the easiest way to explain it. Um, but I was logging those hours and it could be anything from extra hours it takes to run the greenhouse to showing up to my kids livestock shows to doing SAE visits to doing the FFA conferences and conventions. Um, like for instance, we're taking kids to midwinter convention and we're starting at the time of the school day and we're not going to get back to the school until seven thirty, eight o'clock at night. And wow, um, long day. those are the, exactly. And that's, that's one very small example of throughout the year um, of what we do. And when I, in Georgia had that 30 day a year plus 30 hours a month, I was doing still beyond that. Um, so when you're putting in those kinds of hours as a teacher, um, being a teacher is hard enough, but being an ag teacher on top of it is extremely hard. And you have to have a support network, both in the school and at home to be able to work through those things. That actually honestly, like perfectly leads into our next question. Um, <laughs> because there has been you know, a lot of talk about ag teacher shortages, both like happening mm -hmm. now and concern for the future of having, you know, people to replace retiring teachers. Is mm -hmm. that something that is still like kind of top of mind? And how, how can we take steps to address that, that real possibility of not having enough ag teachers? Oh, uh, very much. So um, I can't, figure out the specific number. Um, but I belong to an email blast um, that Penn State puts out every, um, every week of the open positions in Pennsylvania. And uh, this past summer, I know we were well into the teens at almost every week um, of openings that were still e either still vacant, or um, had opened because of a shift. Um, so like, for instance, when I moved from Chambersburg to Shippensburg, my Chambersburg position would have gone on the, on the list after my Shippensburg position was taken off, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the, sh the, the shortage is still there. We, we still are seeing a ton of teachers, um, or not teachers. We're still seeing a ton of vacancies in agriculture education in Pennsylvania. And one of the ways we have seen um, meeting that need is getting industry professionals. So we call them alternatively certified teachers. They didn't go through a traditional four-year bachelor's program um, to obtain their teaching license, but they are working towards a level two cert, which is what um, I am actually just going to be finishing up here soon is my level two cert. And that involves a master's degree. Um, and these alternatively certified teachers, they may or may not have been in agriculture education in high school. Um, for instance, um, I think it's Makara Anderson. She is a phenomenal teacher at Southern Huntington. Um, she went to Penn State, but not for agriculture education. So she may be considered um, alternatively certified. And um, she did go through agriculture education. And I think they... I've, I might be wrong on this because this was while I was in Georgia, but um, I believe she was the president of Pennsylvania FFA. So she's done phenomenally. She knows how much it takes and um, knows where to find the resources and she's well connected. But then there's other teachers that come into the profession that maybe did not go through those programs and don't have the support. So right now I've noticed like PAFFA and our foundation and um, Penn State, the Center for Professional and Personnel Development, they have done um, phenomenal at trying to reach out to those teachers who are alternatively certified and bring them into the umbrella of support to help keep them and retain them. So in addition to the shortage, there's the shortage problem, but then there's also the retention problem. Um, I, there's, I, don't quote me. I can't think of a study off, my, off the top, a specific study off the top of my head right now, but there is... Um, evidence out there that says teacher early teacher burnout happens between two and three years within two or three years of being in the profession. Mm -hmm. And so if we can retain those teachers past year two and three, perhaps we would see less of a turnover in agriculture education. It's a tough, like a tough problem to solve. I mean, because it's like a lot of levels going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I feel, I feel like teaching is also one of those professions where it's love it or hate it. Like you're not going to succeed unless you're 110% committed to it. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Well, and there is some teachers that do a fantastic healthy balance. Um, and um, a part of my award with winning Ideas Unlimited is I got um, to go out to NWE in Phoenix, Arizona this past go round. And they have multiple fantastic programs. First is Teacher Turn the Key. It is designed for teachers between year, I think it's two and five, um, or it might be three and five. And they do professional development on the aspects of agriculture education other than the content. And they, um, uh, them, in addition with the other workshops that I got to participate in, I was not a part of Teacher Turn the Key, but I got to participate in other workshops that help you learn how to establish boundaries. Being able to set up healthy boundaries is another way of helping increase teacher retention and being able to um, say, I'm not going to answer my emails after this time, or I'm not going to grade until 9 p.m. at night. Those are things that um, I am learning now as a fifth year teacher of like, yes, I could be superwoman and do it all, but then I'm lacking in other areas of my life. And um, you are very correct in the sense that um, it is a love it or hate it kind of job, but figuring out how to love it in a healthy relationship is a good way. (laughs) So you talked a little bit about how you worked in Georgia for two years, was it? Um, yeah. As someone who was born and raised in Pennsylvania, uh, was it difficult to teach ag in a place where, you know, the ag industry in the U.S. as a whole, depending on where you are, is very different? So was oh, yeah. it hard to go there and teach ag in a place where their agriculture industry is a little bit different than what you grew up knowing? Correct. Um, it wasn't necessarily hard to teach agriculture um, on the basic level. So I, while I hadn't been super familiar with Georgia agriculture, um, when you understand like basics of raising livestock, basics of plant needs, basics of, um, agribusiness, that sort of thing, it's very transferable, but then you get to do direct, um, Like you get into the direct industry of your local community and it does change. And then I'm learning right alongside with the kids. So um, also it helped a little bit that I wasn't from an agriculture background. So I was already learning agriculture and I wasn't set into the Pennsylvania ways. Um, And I was very flexible to learn the Georgia, Georgia ways. Also, Georgia does ag ed phenomenally. They have tons of resources out there for teachers and, um, it was pr- a pretty easy transition to begin teaching in Georgia. Also, my content, um, I taught basic agriculture, which is like the intro levels. I taught agri- agricultural leadership and communications, which that doesn't really change state to state. Um, and then I also taught, um, I'm blanking on them here, but I also taught c- their version of companion animal care, um, which is like caring for the pets that you see in your households more so than livestock production animals. So dogs, cats, small mammals, reptiles, birds, aquatics, things like that. Um, And I taught a few other courses, but those were the ones that I had most commonly. So those courses were transferable from Pennsylvania. So I didn't see much of a difference in content. Um, I will say the harder part of teaching in Georgia was how intense their ag ed setup is. and uh, like the competitiveness of their FFA programs. Like it was, it was very intense. Um, and the way their extended contracts work, um, I was in a three teacher department. So it, like at our school, we were always doing something. It, even if you had no idea what you were doing, you were finding resources and learning with the kids um, to be able to meet your extended contract. Sounds like one heck of a experience <laughs> for, cause that was your first school was in Georgia. Yeah, yeah, it was a huge school. Um, That was a part of the awe of I flew down. I was student teaching at Dover in Pennsylvania at the time. And I flew down in February for my interview. And it was this beautiful school. And you like walked across like this catwalk type bridge to get to the school. And there was like this little swamp on either side. And it was a massive school because in other states, they do county schools. And so all of the county reports to one high school there. And they do that partially for sports as well. Um, But because the entire county reports to one school, they save a little bit on like administration. They only have one superintendent for the whole district, for the whole county. Whereas like where we grew up in um, Lebanon County stuff, 
um, you had six districts. So that's six superintendents, six superintendent salaries. So um, it was a huge adjustment as far as the landscape of education to get there. Yeah, That's wild. I can't imagine going to a school <sighs> no. that large. Yeah, yeah. If you think about it, so like in Lebanon County, if we if you, we wanted to be a county school, we would have to add Northern Lebanon, Elko, Anvil, Palmyra, um, Lebanon, Cedar Crest all together, and all of those graduating classes would be all in the same graduating class. Um, that was would be essentially wild the size. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of students. I don't. I don't think I would <laughs> have liked college that. size. Yeah. 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 I I went to um a small school in Lancaster County, and my graduating class was about. A little over two hundred. Yeah, that's what and mine I used to was. think that my cousins who went to a larger school in Berks County, they had a graduating class of around four hundred, and I thought that was insanely large. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> nothing compared to Georgia, apparently. <laughs> well, my, and that's the thing that kind of blew my mind a little bit. Also, was even though it was a county school, I believe our graduating numbers were between seven and eight hundred a class. So by the county, the density was much less than mm. what our county is up here. Um, now the larger districts in Georgia, they're still a county school system, but they have multiple high schools. Mm, okay. Okay. I'm so guessing that'd be like Atlanta, smaller. that sort of yeah. thing. Because imagine, yeah, yeah yep. you can't have all the kids in Atlanta <laughs> no. in one Atlanta school. That'd be insane. Building. No. <laughs> I was down um, in the far southeast corner. I was the farthest southeast corner, Camden County. Um, and we had a naval base in our area, Kings Bay Naval mm-hmm. Base. So we had a lot of kids from from the naval base. But otherwise, we were a very rural district. Um, so we didn't have a lot of density of kids. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, aside from winning the Ideas Unlimited Award, what have been some of your proudest moments in teaching? Um, it's hard because you never sit and reflect. <laughs> like you never like pat, pat yourself on the back. This is this um, is your time. It's your moment. Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> Okay. Um, I would say I haven't done much as far as like seeking awards and recognition, things like that. But I have had accomplishments of finding a network and finding a support system, especially as of late, that works for me. Um, Penn State does a mentorship program and um, finding my mentor, Kelly Beer, sincerely changed my life. And she has done amazing things for me as an educator and also her students and her accomplishments as an educator. So um, I would say my accomplishment in getting to Shippensburg and finding success here is an accomplishment in itself. Um, The Ideas Unlimited obviously is a very big accomplishment. I got to do that. Um, I probably have other things, but I'm blanking on them. (laughs) That's okay. Um, (laughs) Those are some very real things to celebrate. Yeah. And um, as far as like things that I'm proud of in, in education, I, I'm just really l- proud of seeing my kids. Um, like actually, uh, yesterday I had some kids reach out to me that I had taught at Chambersburg and the one asked me for a recommendation letter, um, for her to go to farrier school and, um, to become a farrier for horses. And it's just, it's something that I'm very proud of to see my students going into careers or, and going into, um, even careers outside of agriculture and building lives for themselves and utilizing the things that I taught them. That's a very rewarding moment as an educator. That's awesome. That is, that's, yeah. that's, I'm sure makes you feel like everything's worth it. Oh yeah, for sure. It keeps you going in tough times. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. So we have one final question for you that we actually ask to everyone who comes on the podcast, and it's kind of a big one. So, um, Oh, boy. <laughs> brace yourself. Here we go. <laughs> what does being a woman in ag mean to you? I figured you were going to ask me this question, so I tried to think of things, um, and I haven't thought of anything groundbreaking, um, but... I would say being a woman in agriculture just means a ton of opportunities. Um, I have noticed that agriculture is diverse enough and vast enough in its experiences that there is truly a place for everyone. And being a woman in agriculture, while there is struggles with it, um, I think that there's just so many opportunities to learn new things, do new things, meet new people, that um, it's just something that you just want to be a part of. That sounds like a solid enough answer. Yeah, I, was gonna say, <laughs> I thought you did a great job. Thank you. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us at the farmhouse. It was great to have you on. Thank you for having me. Thank you. 
that was honestly it was great talking to her it was great catching up and i feel like yeah i've learned a lot about what it takes to be an ag teacher and leading ffa um i know you actually have had a tiny tiny <laughs> bit of ag teaching experience tiny is right um i used to substitute teach um, for a few years and one time I substitute taught for an ag science teacher and I walked into the room and there were a lot of animals in cages and I immediately panicked because I was very concerned about having to keep all of these animals alive all day as well as make sure that the students didn't like I don't know touch the animals if they weren't supposed to and as part of my duties for the day you know aside from like handing out um, paperwork and stuff for the kids to do was to actually go around and feed the various animals. And, you know, I've had mice and hamsters. My sister had a guinea pig. I've had a hedgehog. So I'm comfortable with small animals. But when they're not your small animals, it's a different story. So that was an interesting day. And, and also the entire extent of me teaching egg <laughs> science. <laughs> was there a rabbit when you taught? There were a few rabbits, yeah. I love that Lisa mentioned that she joined FFA or started taking ag classes because Northern Lebanon had a program where you could end up earning a rabbit because my sister did the same thing her freshman year um, where she had raised a bunny and it had babies and then she was able to keep one of the babies and my parents actually bought one of the babies. I think it was like $10 for me. So we both had rabbits raised by my sister Aww. with the FFA. And what my, were their names? Um, they were both boys they were brothers um mine was muffin and hers was thumper like of course out of bambi of and course. they were just like these giant sweet boys who like my my muffin he let me hold him like a little baby and like rock him he was the best so maybe one day i'll get another rabbit i'm always in favor of naming your pets after food i have a dog named pickle so i love it all right i think that wraps it up for us so um, thank you all for listening to The Farmhouse this week. We love to have you here with us on our journey. And um, I don't know if you want to talk to us. I guess you can email us um, podcast at LancasterFarming.com. I'm Stephanie Spiker. And I'm Candice Wierzbowski. And we'll talk to you later. Bye. This episode is copyright 2024 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written by Candace Wierzbowski and Stephanie Spiker and produced by Eric Herlock. And the music you hear is courtesy of Tinbird Shadow.